Emmett Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Ron Press of Siemens Digital Industry Software. We're going to talk today about total critical area for optimizing test patterns. Ron, this is something of a mouthful. What does it actually mean? Typically, when people would create patterns or sort patterns, organize patterns, it's based on faults and how many faults are detected per pattern. Uh, what's happened more recently is we've um, developed lots of defect-oriented tests, which are tests that look at the physical design to see where can a real defect occur, and then create patterns making sure we can detect those defects. That's a defect-oriented test. Since we have this physical information, now instead of just counting a number of faults to give the value of the pattern, we actually look at what we call critical area, which is the area that a particle needs to fall, which would cause incorrect operation. So with that critical area, now we can sort our patterns based on this critical area with the physical information we have. So we'll sort the pattern based on the likelihood of defects occurring rather than just a count of faults. Because in a bridge, one bridge might be much more likely to have a defect than another bridge. And now we can take account of that. Does it become more difficult as you get into smaller dimensions of advanced nodes and also into some of the advanced packaging to sort out exactly where are the faults and what is a real fault versus a probably not going to amount to something significant? We basically normalize the critical area for that design. So in a particular design, what we're figuring out is how likely for this design is defects at one fault going to occur compared to defects on another fault. Now, let's say you've worked this out yourself uh, on a production line. You know, you have maybe built a stuck at target for coverage, a transition coverage target. If you go to a new fabrication node, a new technology, then it's unclear, okay, what should your targets be? This helps you kind of figure that out by just looking at the critical area and say, okay, for these faults within the design, where are the most likely places you need to target? Ron, what are we looking at here? What exactly is critical area? So, so critical area is a way we can look at, instead of just fault, which is an abstraction of how the circuit behaves in a faulty condition, what we do is actually look at the physical design. We'll take a technology length, which is um, the width of metal one, and then a square of that we'll call a, a technology square. Right. What we're trying to do is look at where a particle, this, this red circle is a particle, representation of a particle, where a particle center would need to fall to cause the circuit not to operate properly. That red area is what we call the critical area. So if you think about, here's an example of a bridge. If there's two nets that are close together and for a long distance, it's much more likely that a particle can cause defect compared to a potential bridge between nets A and B, but they're much further apart for a shorter distance. Very simplistic view. So we need a way to calculate this critical area to see how likely is the defects that can cause one fault, how likely are those defects to occur compared to another fault. So for opens, it's, it's similar. If you have a very narrow run for a long distance, it's more likely that a particle can cause a defect on that compared to a wide one that's a short distance. And these particles can be nano size, right? Right. And so the, you can say, okay, what, what do I consider my, um, you know, is the technology length or the technology square? But if you look at the big picture, it's all basically normalized for the design. So we'll calculate a critical area per layer for your design, and then we'll calculate how much percent of the critical area were you able to detect. Has test always operated on probabilities or did it used to be fixed numbers? Not probabilities as much as a simple uh, percentage metric. So not probability, but usually it's faults, which is an abstraction of how the circuit uh, defect will behave. And usually targets were the percent of faults detected. So every fault basically for a particular fault model was weighted evenly, one to one. Now what we're able to do with critical area, we're able to say this fault is much more important because of the likelihood a defect can occur compared to another fault. Now what you're doing though is you're going bigger picture as well as 
very granular here, right? Because what you're trying to do is figure out what's the probability of a failure in one place, and that's an additive effect to another failure potential for a failure in another area. Yeah, and um, one of the main goals of EDA, and one of the things we do is we enable much more precision and fidelity, like what we can do here looking at the physical design. But the other thing that EDA tries to do, our automation is to make the user's implementation easier. So we, we have this, this fine granularity of figuring out what's the likelihood of the defect, but from the user base, you do some modeling to create these UDFM models of the critical area, and then the user's just creating patterns like they normally would. How far has this shifted left in the design flow? It used to be much further as sort of a discrete step as you went forward in the flow, right? DFT insertion itself has been shifting left continuously. So we're putting in as much as we can early in the design, RTL, or even before the design's RTL there, we can create a lot of our logic. For this type of um, critical area analysis, the final pattern generation, it really needs the design to be complete. So we know, you already know the technology cells, but for bridges and opens and cell neighborhood defects, we need the actual physical design complete. So we'll wait until then to create our final patterns using uh, critical area. So think about this in terms of a bridge, for example. What, sort of, what can go wrong here? What do you have to keep in mind? Yeah, for, for a bridge, there are more than one place the, the two nets can be close to each other. And, and that's what we'll call this a total critical area. So for each location, here we have net A and net B, for each time they're close to each other, we can calculate the critical area just for that point that they're close to each other. And then we look at the entire net and, and calculate the critical area every time they're close enough to cause a defect. And then we can sum up those individual critical areas and we call that total critical area. So that's the metric we use, the likelihood that a defect can cause this bridge to occur. What you're looking at here though, is a defect that's pretty cut and dry, right? It's not, this defect is going to develop over time. It's, we already know this is not going to work because these are the rules. Correct. Yeah, I think if you're concerned with defect over time, the weighting for, of critical area is still as relevant because if there's a much higher critical area or a total critical area for a bridge, then the chance of that bridge failing in the future is more likely than one that has a much lower critical area. You've got several major different pattern types, right? You've got the uh, stuck end pattern, you've got the bridge pattern, and you've got a merge pattern. What are those? Yeah, so the traditional patterns were stuck at and transition patterns. Um, stuck at for a, um, a static pattern and transition for an at speed test. So what we found is when we started modeling the defects inside the cell with cell internal defect modeling, we also call cell aware test. We found that this was great at catching, it's a superset of stuck and transition. You can have a, a cell aware pattern that's a a one cycle pattern or a solar pattern, a two cycle pattern dynamic and catches at speed defects. So it's a superset of stuck at and transition patterns, but it also makes sure that we catch and, and target all the individual defects inside the cell that might not naturally be detected by a traditional stuck at transition pattern. So we know this has a, a, a higher um, defect detection than stuck in transition. So some places they've replaced their stuck in transition patterns with this cell internal or cell aware pattern. But then if we look at, okay, what are the other types of defects gonna occur that we're probably gonna catch most of them, but we wanna make sure we didn't miss any. And so on the interconnect layer, we need to make sure we catch any um, opens defects and any bridge defects. So these will look at the physical design. We, in uh, test and tools, we'll take the left depth and just put it in a layout database. That database is used for diagnosis. We can use the same database for our ATPG. So we'll take that information. And from that, we know um, where are the likely bridges and opens. And we can check, does our existing pattern set already detect the bridges or opens? And do we need to catch more? And then in this other one we show in the, in the upper right, we can do an intercell bridge. So this means we use the cell aware or the cell internal defect modeling for the cells. And we combine that with the layout information that we get from the left def, 
to see where can one cell be near another cell such a bridge can cause a, uh, a defect. So in those cases, we'll do that modeling and make sure that we don't miss any of these bridges. Now, traditionally, one difficult thing is when you're trying to put different patterns together in a pattern set, you would create one pattern type for a fault model. Then you would bring it over to simulate for your next fault model, then do a top-up run to add extra detection for whatever was missed, and then go to the next fault model. What's new here that we can do that's, that's kind of neat is you can define all your fault models up front and then tell the ATPG tool, create my patterns. And what it'll do is it'll consider the various fault models that you're considering all at once and create your pattern so it's an easier flow. And we found uh, so far we've seen up to 40% smaller pattern size by doing that. Does it matter if the chips are getting larger and also going off into increasingly the Z direction in terms of the Z axis? So we're, we're scaling down and we're scaling up, which means by scaling down, now we're actually looking at the physical design to see where defects can occur. So we're going much more precise and trying to be more accurate. At the same time with these larger designs, um, 3D stacking devices or just designs getting huge, Everything we're doing is trying to fit into a plug and play methodology. So we'll create our patterns at the core level um, with these new pattern types or defect oriented test and optimization. And then we can actually just map those patterns up through the design hierarchy to the top level of the device. So as a device is scaling bigger and bigger, what we're doing is trying to make everything plug and play. So you can create your patterns at the core or the block level and then just map it up to the top. There's another challenge here too, though, which is that you've got new materials coming in, you've got very thin materials coming in. And then on top of that, you also have um, multiple metal layers here that, that are increasingly playing a, a more critical role throughout a lot of these designs. Does any of that affect what you're doing here with TEST? It, it does. Um, you know, when we're looking at the, the technology cells, that's in one layer. We're looking at the opens and the bridges in a different layer. And for each layer, when we do this critical area optimization, we calculate the, the total critical area for the layer and try to figure out how much detection we have for that layer. Eventually, we're working on having it so you can add a little more precision where you can say a particular layer has a defectivity rate that's different than another layer. Right now, we, we count it all as equal for equal size particle, equal size uh, defectivity rate. But we're, we're putting switches in to give you a little bit more uh, fidelity to adjust that based on the layer. How much pressure has this come under with things like uh, automotive chips, particularly the logic chips that are going to be at the, the central brain of, of increasingly autonomous vehicles? where they have to function for 20 years, but they also are pushing at the most advanced nodes for some of this. We used to call defect-oriented test, we would only refer to it as automotive-grade ATPG, because the automotive industry always has the, the most stringent requirements for, for quality, um, you know, single-digit uh, defects per million, or maybe even single-digit defect per billion. But we've actually seen the adoption of defect-oriented test is much more broad than automotive. That's why I've been referring to it as defect-oriented test because any product that is expensive and goes into an expensive higher level product, um, any escape can really be uh, difficult financially. So you, you need to make sure that uh, for some of these products, a lot of our customers will use this defect-oriented test for products that don't have anything to do with automotive but their concerns with the um, escape rate is, is similar. And really, if you're pushing down to the most advanced nodes, you're probably in that area anyway, right? These are going to be expensive chips. You don't want something to go wrong. That's right. Um, and it's, it's interesting because, you know, we've published a lot on cellular test, which is one of the first defect-oriented tests to get uh, broad uh, adoption. If, if you look at some of the publications we have, um, some of the nodes are like 350 nanometer, um, older technologies, but in automotive parts, they have to have, you know, very, very uh, low DPMs. But then we also have in the newest FinFET technologies, lots of adoption of defect-oriented test. It could be an automotive, it could be other areas, but just that 
they need the processing power, so they need the smaller geometry so they can get more logic on. And especially going to new technology nodes is always concern. And one is the ability to diagnose a problem and understand what's going on to improve um, fabrication. But the other is to not let escapes get into your uh, customer base or the next level of uh, test. Test is now also sort of multi-level, right? Because this is one critical piece of what you're trying to do, but there are other tests that you'll want to do both uh, immediately as well as throughout the product's lifetime. Yeah, and that's been changing um, on what tests people do at which level. So wafer test, there's still lots of wafer tests and then package part test. But it used to be for some types of products, fewer products, there was... Um, in-system test with memory BIST and logic BIST. Now the requirements, and a lot of that was driven by automotive, but there's other industries too. The requirements are growing on the amount of test and the amount of fidelity we need to check um, for in-system environments. And, and this includes now even um, ATBG style patterns are now being uh, employed in system operation. You know, when there's downtime, they'll run some Used to be run logic based, memory based. Now some companies are running uh, deterministic tests uh, during system operation. When you get down to these advanced nodes and these complex chips, almost all of them are also customized. I mean, we're, we're seeing one off type of designs a lot of times. How does that affect what you're doing here? Ron, one last question here. What happens in terms of usage models? How do those change? Well, what it is, it gives people a better tool. To, to figure out how they're gonna apply their patterns and what's a, the smartest way to deal with them. So one usage model is if you already have several pattern sets and you need to truncate the patterns to make them smaller, now what you can do is do your critical area modeling for, these, um, for the fault models, read those pattern sets in, and then we can optimize and order the patterns based on critical area. So now when you truncate, We've balanced all these patterns together to really put the most effective ones based on critical area first. So that's one use model. Another is if you're going to try a new fault model you haven't tried before and you create a pattern set for it, say something like a bridge, now you can look at those bridges and find out which are the bridges that are most likely to have an impact um, because the physical defects are going to cause the bridge uh, to fail, which are the most likely bridges to include. And you can add those as a sample set. And then the last use model, which is, uh, I think, the biggest advantage, once you've decided which fault models you want to use in production, you can read in the critical area modeling, which is in UDFM files. And then you can do one ATPG session with all of your fault models together. And by doing this, you have a smaller uh, pattern set. It's an easier run in a smaller pattern set. The, the only stipulation is you have to model the stuck at or the, say, the, uh, the, the slow patterns together, and you need to model the dynamic or the at speed patterns together. You can't merge those two. Ron Press, thanks for a great explanation. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Ed.